You are listening to the Pencil and Paper Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to Cinema Salsa, your tasty condiment of film talk. I'm your host, Stephen White, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Philip Peck. What's up? I don't know. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. That's, yeah, that's, we've been... That's your fault, not mine. I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize we were both that busy. Um, yeah, it's, it's just been a minute, but uh, it's, no no worries. We're still around. We're hitting it up whenever we can, and uh, I'm sure it's given us a lot of time to watch a few things. Uh, I've actually not watched a few things that I've wanted to watch, but... Uh, I know one thing in particular that we've mentioned in the prior episode we're going to talk about a little later. Uh, probably not at great length, but I'm sure it'll come up quite a bit. But uh, yeah, it's since it's been a minute, what, what have you been watching within that time that you can remember worth talking about? Or not. It has been a while. So um, the big one, I guess, would be uh, Dune. Yeah, that's the one I've got to put. Like, it's on my list, but... I know the length of it, and I'm like, ah, I gotta, I gotta commit to that. You haven't seen it yet? No, it's like I said, I keep seeing it on there, and I, I don't want to miss the window of opportunity on HBO, and I just, I keep debating. It's just like, ah, it's a long movie, but ah, I want to watch it so bad. So I've got to, I've got to get past the barrier of saying it's a long movie, well, and just remember it's going to be a good movie. It is from good. What I've heard, it is really good. Um, I've, I've actually seen it twice. I went and saw it opening weekend in a theater mm-hmm. i was really excited to go see it in imax but my wife did not want to go to the imax theater because she just really loves the reclining seats that they have now at yeah. green hills so it's like green hills are nothing for her it's really it, i mean we go see movies at the bell court and those they're, they're super uncomfortable chairs yeah um so i'm not sure why so we we saw it at green hills and we saw it even like not even at like one of their first run theaters so it was like kind of a smaller screen I was really disappointed, but it was still it was still good. And then I actually watched it again at home on HBO Max. I mean, without spoiling anything, everybody knows at this point. I hope that it's just the first part, and they have they have officially announced that there will be a a second part to it. Because I, I guess that was still up in the air, more or less, mm-hmm. when this movie was actually released. But um, it it ends, you know, kind of on a anticlimactic note, I think. You know, you think about like Star Wars and the the, the first trilogy, and kind of how the uh, Empire Strikes Back is it's definitely that middle movie that doesn't have kind of an ending. It's it's kind of it's a cliffhanger, but it it still has a satisfying drama, and it is like a true cliffhanger. So you definitely want more. Mm-hmm. This movie, like you know, there's more to it, but it just kind of it's just like oh, we're just we're kind of arbitrarily stopping it right here. I hope that's not too spoilery, but. I mean, it's not a spoiler, but just kind of like... Um, I guess it sets up an expectation because I, I felt like I heard something to that degree, but not quite like that. So if I'm sitting there watching this movie and <laughs> it's just like, ah, oh, we're, we're, we're just going to stop right here. Like watching a Netflix show that you're supposed to binge and you just stop halfway through. Yeah, I could see where that would be. A little disappointing if you were that you're really getting into it. Yeah, especially since you know you've got to wait another two years mm-hmm. for the the next part. So, but yeah, I liked it. I wasn't sure. I'm not a I'm not a big Dune person. I've never read any of the novels, and um, so it didn't really mean anything to me. Like I wasn't a fanboy about it or anything. But and Denis Villeneuve, his movies are kind of hit or miss for me as well. Hmm. I do like some of them quite a lot, and then some of them are just kind of leave me leave me a little bit cold, or just there's something about him that is more like analytical and um, like kind of passionate. I say, I mean, I'm sure he he and I've listened to a lot of interviews when he's talking about Dune and how much it means to him and how much he's really wanted to make this movie for basically his whole life. Yeah, but anyway, so yeah, that's the big one. I guess I saw. In the theaters, did we talk about Green Knight last time we talked? I don't think we had. So I watched the Green Knight, and I watched a new movie that came out on Netflix last week, "The Harder They Fall," which is like a a new western 
with an all um black cast and that was not mm -hmm. it was okay it was way too long like that should have been like a sh an hour and a half at most yeah and kind of like it, it it got better i think if you get past like the opening maybe 30 minutes where it seems like a made for tv movie it, it kind of gets it, it gets it's like there's a lot of stylistic choices that they made in it that i am you know appreciate that they they try to do some stuff but the story is pretty pretty bare bones and i don't know why it needed to be that as long as it is but i don't know i haven't seen i guess dune would be the, the really big thing that i've seen that would be worth talking about i guess at any length i haven't seen the uh new marvel movie the eternalists the uh oh yeah and the eternals <laughs> whatever it's called i can't remember the individualist no that's not right yeah yeah i mean from what i'm hearing i haven't seen it either and it's not really by choice just you know my weekends have been busy since it came out so it was just like oh i'll get around to it and f from what i'm hearing i'm not missing much either yeah which is a shame uh, because they really, really hyping it up as being unique. Uh, you know, you got a unique voice and Chloe Zhao. And it's like, look at what we're doing. We're doing something art house. And then everybody's like, no, I don't like it. Well, I mean, it didn't but, really turn out to be very art housey from what I've heard. It's just like, it kind of has a visual, like they made a big deal about shooting on location as opposed to shooting in studio lots and green screens. But it, mm -hmm. it, what I've heard is it ends up looking just like your typical Marvel movie anyway with just a yeah. bunch of CGI monsters and battles and you know her like blue hour sunset shots and things like that don't really change the the feel of the movie or make it seem like something that Marvel hasn't done before yeah which I mean that's a shame too because your one opportunity to really do something different and it becomes your worst reviewed from what I'm hearing movie ever. Yeah. Well, it seems like were... she's still like she's still down for making more. So even though it hasn't been well received, probably to her expectation, she doesn't seem to be too deterred by the response anyway. So yeah, I, I suppose I just I, I feel like they don't give their directors all that much creative freedom at first. Yeah. And I mean, if you go back to, I mean, they, they all kind of have a by committee, you know, mm -hmm. feel to them, but there is, I mean, there are a few that you could actually point to and say, all right, that has a director's unique flavor to it that they, they were actually allowed to push, uh, buttons and boundaries and go a, a step beyond but why not give her she seems so capable why not give her that same freedom that you awarded or for, to anybody else for that matter well it seems like and again i haven't seen the movie but it, i don't know even though if, if it's really like a directing um issue so to speak, or if it's just a story issue, it just seems like the story, the the script is just probably not good enough to support really her, yeah, for her to, to do really anything with it. You have like a huge uh -huh. cast that spans like 7,000 years. You just, st you know, it's like has that typical Marvel movie bloat of, of, of kind of like the Avengers movies, I think, where you just have so many characters and you're trying to cram so much backstory into a two hour window where it's mm. like, what at that point, what story are you even telling? And that's the that's one of the big problems I have with a lot of these Marvel movies is that, you know, they are serialized in essence, and like a lot of the movies in themselves just don't seem to be very good, compelling movies, you know, mm -hmm. outside of like the overarching thing that they're going for. But that would seem to that would be my kind of take on it. And again, not having seen it. There's just not, there doesn't seem like there's much drama there or really much intrigue. Like there's not, the characters aren't very interesting. There's just all sorts of problems with the movie aside from just her not really putting her unique vision or directing imprint on it, I suppose. But yeah, it seems like that something 
like that project would have worked better in a serialized format where you could really kind of get to know the characters, especially over a span yeah. of 7,000 years. You could play with so many different time periods. Yeah, this seems like one that would really have benefited from going to uh, streaming, like a TV show like WandaVision or Loki. Yeah. I mean, really explore those characters in different time periods and, and things that they could have influenced over the centuries and... I don't know. That just seems like it would have made for for such a better narrative for those characters specifically. Yeah. It, mm. it seems... Did you ever see The Old Guard? Uh, I, it, it sounds familiar. Charlie Theron and... I'm not sure if there, there was a lot of other actors who I'm not really familiar with, kind of smaller actors, but um, mm -hmm. it was a very similar kind of concept. It was uh, an original story, original movie that... Um, premiered on netflix and it's been out for a, probably a year and a half or two years now but like sort of um uh, immortal like cast of characters who i can't even remember like their 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 mission essentially but um it yeah kind of has a very similar thing but it's just so much more focused on telling the story in the present as opposed to you know jumping back and forth through time and i just think that, yeah that's just a that's just a hard thing to do in a two-hour window. It's just you really have to yeah. focus on a story first. But they just want to build the world. They want to introduce the characters and their relationships. And there's just not time for that, I don't think. Yeah, well, not definitely not in a film. Yeah, you know that's what yeah it, that's what I mean. And just one standalone right, right. movie. I don't know. They just didn't seem like the type of characters built for that. And maybe they were taking risks on kind of what they did early on you know i mean obviously iron man didn't used to be a household name and they were just like well, let's try and see if this will work and it paid off yeah but that's just but, one character right you know exactly. not, a, not the, 10 and like no, nobody knows these i mean i don't know these characters i grew up reading comic books and i don't know them at all yeah the eternals are like one of those real deep cuts like you have to know your comic book lore and, and really, really have gone in for, for a deep cut like that. And that's why I don't think they had the appeal to cross over in the same way as someone like Iron Man and Captain America. They they may not have been big names to the general public, but I feel like they were kind of there enough Oh yeah. to where people are like, oh, yeah, I kind of know who that character is. But, yeah, these characters, who the, <laughs> the hell are the Eternals? Again, I know of them from comics. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing snippets, you know, here and there. It's like, hey, yeah, vaguely familiar, but not not 100% sure. I actually heard that characters they introduced at the very end of the film, you know, the, the post credits, because let's face it, you can't keep anything quiet anymore. Mm -hmm. So I had no qualms about having these mid credits and end credit sequences spoiled for me, but they introduced two characters I was more familiar with than the actual initial cast of the entire internals. I found that to be <laughs> funny to me. Other people may not be familiar with them, but I was, and it was just like, eh, that's funny. Well, yeah. And but anyway. I, well, I think it, it just, in speaking of deep cuts, like Shang-Chi, like a mm -hmm. like a non-entity character, like even when sort of a gimmicky character on um, from its inception, and a, a character that would just pop up every decade or so in some supporting role, but it just makes for a more interesting movie when you can focus on the backstory of one character as opposed to a whole ensemble of non-household names. So, sure. And, and Disney seems to be doubling down on all these uh, Disney Plus shows, you know, Marvel-based shows. They announced like a slew of them yesterday on Disney Plus Day because, hey, everybody wants to celebrate Disney and their achievement of streaming services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. And what, we're, what are we going to give you? We're going to give you snippets and little teases of things because, hey, that's... We want you to know where your money's going, and you're going to give us more because look what we're giving you. You sound cynical. Right. <laughs> Maybe, all right, just a little, but I'm just saying. Anyway, what else? Did you watch anything else? No, not really. Nothing worth yeah. mentioning, I don't think. I watched okay. Total Recall a couple of nights ago for the first time. Original or uh, Colin yeah. Farrell? No, man. Okay. 
Just making sure. <laughs> I mean, everything's got a remake these, these days. None of these rehashed, sanded down, w- warmed over bullshit. <laughs> now who's cynical? Uh, yeah, I know. Oh, psh, talking to the <laughs> master cynic over here, man. No, I, yeah, I had never seen Total Recall, and I was just, I don't even know why. There's something about, I don't know what made me want to watch that. Oh, I was listening to a podcast and people were talking about Paul Verhoeven and um, RoboCop. I really wanted mm-hmm. to watch RoboCop, but it's, it wasn't available for free. I mean, you could pay, you could rent it for like three dollars. Sure. They had Total Recall, so I watched that. That was something. Is better or worse than you possibly thought? Um, I think it was kind of. I think it met my expectations somehow. It was just okay. about. It was about what I expected, because I was never allowed hey. to watch it when I was a kid. Hmm. You know, grew up hearing about how gory and gross it was, and all these different things, and I was scared to watch it. And um, so I, I, it was fun to it was fun to see all that now as an adult and thinking back, like, oh, what? How would have? what would my reaction have been if I would have seen it when I was, you know, a teenager or something? It would right. have had a greater impact on me, I'm sure. And the, I think it would have been a pretty cool movie to have seen at that time. Sure, yeah. Um, but um, I, I I liked it. It's a really interesting movie and an interesting premise. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger is just such a terrible actor in this movie, I think. He's not always, you know, I think he can play yeah. certain characters, but only when he's playing like robots and I think he works better but when he's trying to play a real person he's just I don't know he just looks so I, I, he's so stiff but it's just yeah. I think it's part of the charm I think of the movie and um I wish they had taken out the romance between him and the um the freedom fighter I can't remember her yeah. name because the, the lines are just like they're so cheesy it's like are you serious right now like you guys just got grievously wounded by this like um, drill machine hmm. and you should be like writhing in agony and yet you're like kiss me and let's I, it's just it's weird it like takes you out of the I mean it, well it doesn't take you out of the movie because the movie's kind of like totally it's like kind of a farce and kind of a um, I mean Paul Verhoeven I don't know you never know what that guy but <laughs> it's interesting I mean it it makes you laugh hmm. I guess but it's like should I be laughing or should I be should, is it serious is it funny yeah I don't know I like it because you have more of a reaction. I think I have more reaction to Total Recall than I did to Dune. Yeah. And I think that's always a good thing. <laughs> Even though I, mean, I did like Dune, but yeah. I don't think it's going to provoke the kind of feelings that something like Total Recall did. Yeah. Beerhoven, his style is... I like it. You know, I like his films and just where it's this odd blend of satire mixed in with... You know, some real heavy action, gory, over-the-top type stuff. And you don't know where it's at half the time, you know, but it works. I feel like it does. I mean, RoboCop's a fine example of that. I feel like Starship Troopers was a, another great example of that. So, yeah, I mean, there's not, it's, Total Recall is probably not one of those that I revisit a lot, but uh, I've seen it a few times, and I'm like, yeah, it's entertaining. Mm-hmm. I get joy out of it. What about you? What have you been watching? As far as films, I really don't know of anything that stood out as something I've watched. Because I I really honestly can't think of anything specific. I think I've rewatched a few uh, older films, like where they had... um, One of my, my daughters had told me, and I guess it makes sense if you do the math... Sometimes it just, when I'm reminded of my age, I'm like, damn, has it been that long? Yeah. One of my daughters um, had mentioned, like, we'd had a conversation and the movie Scream had got brought up and she said, I've never seen that. And I was like, well, we got to fix that. <laughs> so they had uh, just put out like a 4K version of it. And I thought, great, I, did, I can kind of revisit it and she can revisit it and or see it for the first time. And then there we go. So I got that, we watched it, and she was thoroughly entertained, and that just kind of got us on a roll of watching the rest in the series, and they're hit or miss, you know. Yeah, I mean, the 
there's a fifth one coming out next next month or two. Yeah, Some, I, I think saw the trailer January. for when I was at Dune. Mm. And look, I'm just gonna say this: I, I have I don't know anything about the movies, but considering they're bringing back the same three people who've been in every single movie and somehow survived, I think it's time they die. <laughs> And I don't mean that. I don't mean that in any like malicious. Like I want them to die, but you're bringing them back again. I think the time has come where they they get theirs. Either write them out or kill them. Because how many more times At can least they go David Arquette? This? I mean, come on, man. Yeah, man. How's that guy? Stabbed? How did he make it out? Right. How many times did he get attacked and stabbed and damn near killed? And every time he just limped away i don't know i haven't seen those in in, in a long time i know i mm. saw scream 2 in the theaters and that's probably the last time i saw scream 2 and i've seen scream the original a few times but it's been it's been a while yeah and, out of oh go ahead well no i mean just another speaking of reboots and rehashing and at least they're at least they're bringing back this one i mean horror movies i think there's more of an expectation for this and it's been i mean Horror movies never die. Or horror yeah. franchises never die. And I'm more okay with them rebooting Scream than doing like a total recall slash or total um what was the other one? They, oh, RoboCop. Yeah. But you know, they're they're bringing the original cast back, so at least you have that continuity and um that familiarity and that history and then you have a storyline that could that can reach back to the past and you're not just do, it's not just all new characters and just the name they're bringing back. So maybe this will be... It's just like, you know, Halloween. I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis and... Sure. She appears in all, a lot of the new Halloween movies and... Anyway, I don't know. The The, the trailer looked looked okay. It, it, it was... Mm -hmm. It didn't look terrible. So... No, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in checking it out. Yeah. I just... I don't know what more you can do with those characters because... You got to be traumatized by that point. I mean, this has happened so many times. How many more times can you go through this? That's all I'm saying. I don't want them to die, but I like that there's still continuity. But again, you're bringing them back again. That's all I'm saying. And anyway, um, so yeah, I watched those. I don't know if we if we had talked about Halloween Kills before all that. No, last time. I think the last time we talked, it was. I don't know if it had even released yet. So, Is yeah. It, did you so see I, that? I did. I did watch that. I I know that there was some shade thrown at it, um, which I, I guess I had my expectations set when I came in. And I know critics can be a lot harder on uh, horror films than they do other things. So I really don't take them at their word. With horror, if I like it, I like it. If they don't. It's just not their cup of tea, and I get it. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I started hearing a lot of the negativity about Halloween Kills, I paid it no mind. I had a lot of fun with it. I enjoyed it. I This is the movie I expected it to be in some ways, and even some unexpected ways. Um, but I, I enjoyed it. It was what it was for me, and I even watched it twice. And tried to see if there was something I missed that all these people were going on about. And I just don't know what more they're thinking it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think one one obvious critique that I could say, okay, fair enough. But even still, I don't wholeheartedly agree with is that it didn't push the narrative forward. And... I don't feel like that's 100% accurate because I feel like it added some uh, backstory to the mythos. It kind of shifted the narrative focus. If uh, I'm being, I mean, just from, from my perspective, that's how I would see it. By the end of the movie, something has changed in what we think we know about the narrative of this franchise or what it's about and i feel like that was kind of setting the stage for what the third act will be and so on and so forth so i i don't i don't necessarily agree with with everything that i read but 
I, I had a lot of fun with it. I'm looking forward to the next uh, installment or last, whatever they want to call it. Did you watch it by by chance? Nope. No. Yeah, my well, wife's not down for that, so. Yeah, it's fine. It's I'll fine. have to wait till it comes to streaming, and I can check it out mm-hmm. on my own. I oh, guess. Was on the Peacock, but then you got to pay for Peacock, and I paid for it because it was just cheaper than going out to the theater. <laughs> right. Yeah, I've reached my limit on streaming services, and hmm. Peacock didn't make the cut. Well, that I actually uh, paid for a month. But I actually did cancel it here recently because uh, another thing I got obsessed with while I had Peacock, this is not a movie, but a TV show. Uh, I don't know if you've watched it or not. It's called Yellowstone. Have mm-hmm. you heard of it? Nope. It's, um, I've heard people talking about it. Like my I father, he was, it, yeah. he was one of those people. He was asking me if I'd seen it. And of course, they're talking about it on this network that I don't have because I don't have cable. And they're just like, yeah, it's on the Paramount Network. Check it out. And I was like, okay, well, if, if I ever find it somewhere, I'll check it out. Well, with Peacock, they had the seasons that were available. And I thought, okay, everyone's talking about this. While I've got the service, let's check it out. Let's, let's see what it, it's all about. And I got sucked in pretty quick. <laughs> it, was a, it was actually uh, surprising because this was probably the first drama in a long time that actually hooked me. You know, that's not about superheroes and, and you know medical dramas and stuff like that like this is just this is about a, a a man who owns a lot of land out in montana like forty thousand plus acres and of course land developers are wanting the land so it's pretty much like this battle for this man to hang on to his fifty thousand acre spread of cattle and ranches and whatnot and the people who have the um, audacity to come after him, whether it be uh, land developers or there was a uh, reservation nearby and the, the head guy over uh, one of the biggest businesses on the reservation is wanting to acquire the land back for his people. So that causes a conflict. So you've got like three or four sides fighting over land. Pretty much. And then, of course, there's family drama. But uh, Kevin Costner kind of leads the cast. Hmm. And uh, I don't, you don't, you don't see him very often in anything, but he's, he's damn good in this, you know. Grizzled up old cow hand, you know, landowner. So I would recommend it if you happen to find it on anywhere right now. Uh, again, I've only seen it on Peacock. And the fourth season just started back up. And that was one of the reasons we were checking it out. But, you know, Peacock didn't want to start streaming the fourth season, so that's why they got the cut. <laughs> it sounds uh, maybe similar to Ozark in a way. I don't know. Are you maybe. familiar with Ozark? Uh, I've heard of Ozark, and it's it's definitely one of those I want to check out because I've heard a lot of great things about it as well. But yeah. just haven't gotten around to it. Yeah. Maybe if, you, yeah, if you're into the Yellowstone, maybe you'd be into Ozark too. I haven't seen – I've seen a few episodes of it. I didn't really – grab me but i mean i know a lot of people do love it so mm. but yeah uh, i would recommend yellowstone uh, I, I i didn't go into great details because um there's a lot of great characters in there and mm-hmm. stories just kind of interweave and it's, it's more fun as it kind of unfolds because i didn't know very much about it but maybe maybe check out a trailer for it or something online i'm sure there's one somewhere so um, but yeah that's it's really all I can think that I've been watching. But I really, I definitely need to check out Dune, and I really, really want to watch that movie Lamb. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> and that just weirds me out, but I want to see it so bad, you know, just because of that. And, and I've heard a lot of good things about it, too, so I'm, I'm excited to check it out. Hopefully, I'll have it watched, both of them. Has that already come in, gone to theaters? I think it yeah, I think it's in theaters, and because uh, I've seen it on the theaters at home uh, section of rentals, that's that's why I've been eyeballing it. Because I'm like, ah, there it is. I want to check it out so bad. <laughs> and I would I would easily pay you know full ticket price for it as well. Because it's just it just weirds me out, man. Yeah, <laughs> but I want to see it so bad. And so hopefully I can check those out. You got anything you're looking forward to? 
Um, that's a good question. No, I don't know. I haven't really been paying much attention hmm. to. Uh, there, there really isn't anything on my on my radar. I'm just I'm just kind of going through the backlog. Uh, trying okay. to pick out some stuff that's on the streaming services that I subscribe to, so Netflix and Amazon Prime and uh, HBO Max, yeah, and just trying to whittle things down from uh, from my watch lists. And I don't think there's really anything coming up in theaters. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some stuff coming out this year that I want to go see, but I haven't really made a list yet. So maybe next yeah. week I'll I'll get on that, get on compile the list of things coming out. Fair I guess I'd the French the... Dispatch would be one thing, but I'm not, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sold on it. Yeah. The kind of anthology story or the anthology um, format. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it'd be fun to watch. Could be. I don't know if I've heard anything about it. It did come out, right? Oh yeah, it's been out for a few weeks. Yeah. Hmm. I honestly cannot remember hearing anything about it. It's weird. I guess it came and went. Well, I mean, it's a Wes Anderson movie. It's not going to be a huge blockbuster, but I think it's, even by his standards, it may be a little bit um, a hard sell. Given that it's not yeah. one narrative, it's really, it, it is like an anthology. It's just um, a handful of, of self-contained stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's always a disappointment when it's harder to get people to buy into it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's really for the... I mean, anybody who's into a diehard Wes Anderson fan would, would go see it, but people who aren't, then it definitely would be a tough sell. Like, what is this <laughs> movie? I don't know what this is. Yeah, I get that. Well, if you want, we can talk about a, a less hard sell, apparently, uh, or at least it used to be, I would assume. And that's our uh, topic today, talking about Korean cinema... And even when I say cinema, I feel like I'm, I'm putting it under a tighter umbrella. But I feel like I want to talk about uh, everything from movies to even TV shows. And kicking that off essentially would be Squid Game, since we had talked about uh, checking that out last time we spoke. Because I think you had you watched any of it at that point? I had just started watching it. You had just started watching it and you were recommending it. So mm -hmm. I went back or I went on your recommendation, of course, hearing about it. And I started watching Squid Game, pretty much binged it within two days. Um, it was it was really good. It was really solid. And it got me wondering, like, when did this, um, I don't want to say a renaissance of Korean cinema, but but just kind of, it's, it's seeping into our culture here and i don't mean that in a derogatory sense in any way it's just but thinking about it when did that actually start to occur occur because squid game has suddenly become this huge hit and it's a korean production trained to busan got a lot of praise when it came out korean uh snow piercer i remember when that came out uh, there was a lot of of uh you know, direct, uh, attention brought to it. And then we can kind of go on through various others. Parasite was another one. One best picture that year, did it not? It did. Yeah. 2019. So, I mean, there, or 20, yeah, 2019, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, we have all these films that seem to be seeping into our culture and they're being embraced, they're not being rejected. And I don't feel like we've seen that with a lot of other. Um, foreign films and mm. it's it's fascinating like what what's happened to where these stories which I would argue are more um, based in Korean culture than anything in our own do you feel like that there that there's a reflection that I'm not seeing that we could see our culture and their culture because it's just it's it's a fascinating thing to me that that, that Korean cinema has, has become embraced in this country the way it has. Um, I don't know about the cultural aspect of it. Um, I, and we're not talking, aside from Squid Game, we're not necessarily talking about massive blockbuster hits. No, no, no. 
so they're definitely more of a niche follow you know they don't have you know a mass appeal i would say um but i would just say that the stories have been or it's i think there's well there's of course there's not just one thing we're talking about korean cinema or korean filmmaking or tv there's a, a pretty broad swath of of different genres and different styles but um i think um park chung book was was maybe one of the first directors who kind of um, impacted or, you know, had an impact in the West with Old Boy. Mm-hmm. And there's just a um, a visual style that was really striking that I think um, really set that movie apart. And it was also, you know, just um, one of those movies where a certain type of person would just, you know, has this really twisted, convoluted narrative and, you know, all these twists and turns. And I, so I would I would say it's really just the stories have just appealed to people and the style of the director the directorial style and the filmmaking style is very bold i think for a lot of these projects as well and i think that's grabbed a lot of people's attention one well i'm sure there's tons and tons of parallels and i wish i had done more thinking and research before we started talking about this but are you familiar with train spotting yes Mm -hmm. you know so it's a western but it's it's foreign obviously it's scottish english and has definitely i mean that culture is recognizable to us but it's very very different as well right but i would say that the the style of that movie had such an impact um you know with the music the cuts and the visuals and i think it's sometimes Four movies can just kind of cut through or break through the, you know, in an, in another market. I think based on just their you, their perceived uniqueness, their their differentness. You know. Yeah. I mean, with a, a lot of these films, I've noticed that I was trying to to kind of get a sense of of the the ones that have kind of made that crossover the ones that seem to have been embraced by a wider audience because, like you said, they're not like huge blockbuster hits, at least not here. Right. But they did something where they caught more than just a, a small audience attention. I mean, when you talk about uh, foreign cinema from, from any other country, say uh, Japan, for instance, there seems to be this... Uh, immediate mindset that we're talking about monster movies or anime uh chinese cinema you could think nothing more than uh monks and 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 martial arts you have and and those kind of fit into a, a specific niche for a specific audience you know not everyone wants to see monster movies not everyone's into martial arts films and these seem to to have, I guess you could argue that there is a, a sl- an oddity to to each of their narratives that obviously wouldn't be uh, commonplace. But there seems to be a different theme. It's not just it's not like it's just Korean horror or or uh, Korean drama or anything like that. I mean, Squid Game. There's a odd blend of I would even say comedy uh, drama slight horror Mm -hmm. you know just depending on how you want to view it then you go to something like train to busan straight horror but with a lot of heart um like you parasite i mean that's i've I've seen it listed under comedy and and maybe i didn't quite i mean i don't remember laughing all that hard (laughs) i mean there were moments yeah where you'd be like oh (laughs) but that that's always kind of bothered me every time i see it listed as a comedy i'm like this this is not a comedy per se um family drama would kind of be would you agree Mm -hmm. that feels like an appropriate tag for it uh old boy or lady vengeance i mean those are just straight up revenge flicks Mm -hmm. in a manner of speaking so they're everything it's it's like a you're running the gamut on different kind of genres it's not just one thing that seems to have to have made an impact on that crossover. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it is kind of interesting. I mean, because I mean, there's a long history of of Japanese cinema and other countries, obviously, without trying to paint with too broad a brush here, hmm. that have their own cinema, and it's not all you know Godzilla movies or or whatnot. 
um, but they don't always break through into the West. And if they do, it's on a on a you know kind of a cinephile kind of scale. Like I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Akira Kurosawa and hmm. um, uh, Akira uh, Ozu. I can't think of his other name, but anyway, who are widely revered as some of the greatest filmmakers of all time but probably wouldn't reach a mass audience if you asked a random Joe on the street who those people are they probably wouldn't know and I, what what about Korea, you know what is it about the Korean cinema that has managed to um, break through to a more mainstream audience I think um, maybe they they just kind of they've just gone for well I think also it's hard to not mention K-pop as kind of a, a a um trojan horse in a way for korean culture mm. it's um been a huge cultural um export that i think has maybe kind of greased the wheels for more korean art and culture to kind of to push through different different countries and different audiences mm-hmm. and I, I don't think you would see like the there's a huge quantity of like Korean stuff like just on Netflix, um, yeah, yeah, not just movies but just TV shows, serialized shows, and stuff that's like is not wasn't meant for like Western audiences, but and then there's also a lot of stuff that maybe has more of a an aim to appeal to Western audiences. Um, but I don't think you would see that huge influx of just Korean stuff on Netflix if it weren't for the massive popularity of Korean pop music. Mm. You know, it's just kind of a ready-made audience. People who are already interested in Korean music, therefore, would be more interested in other Korean cultural exports in there. That's why you have just a huge amount of stuff on Netflix alone. Mm. And then, of course, Squid Game pops up on Netflix, and it's just like, it's just prime. People are just primed to, to just start watching it because they're already, they're already kind of conditioned to to pick up on new Korean stuff. And then when it's something that's this good, then it just kind of people start hearing more and more about it. I mean, I think that was a true kind of like word of mouth hit. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. it wasn't promoted in any way by Netflix at all, mm-hmm. and it really was just. I mean, I started hearing about it on Twitter, and then. I mean, everybody I talked to in my day-to-day life had heard about it, you know, from through word of mouth. And but I, yeah, I mean, I think it. There is something about Korean culture that, the popular culture that has reached kind of this, this base appeal. Yeah, the the K-pop uh, element of it was something that it never occurred to me. But you're absolutely right. They that seemed to have had a huge crossover appeal at some point where it was just boom there's k-pop and and that's that so yeah that could definitely be part of that that uh, equation that i didn't even consider because like you said you're you're kind of introduced into that culture one direction and then it just leads you down another path same like i would even kind of agree that's uh that godzilla films have led me into more films in uh, Japanese cinema, for yeah. that matter, because you get familiar with this or you get familiar with that, and then you just start kind of digging down a rabbit hole and you find other things that you enjoy. Uh, but yeah, it, it just it struck me odd about uh, Korean cinema, especially you had mentioned uh, Park Chan Wook mm-hmm. being one of the directors that kind of really had a crossover, but uh, Bong Joon Ho, mm-hmm. those two, the, the two of them seem to be a, a, a through line. To a lot of this stuff now granted i don't i didn't see their names attached to squid game but no. for some of the others that we we spoke of uh they were obviously responsible for uh at least half of those between the two of them mm-hmm. and if not all of them no they didn't uh, the other one would be uh trained to busan that was another director as well mm-hmm. i'm not sure his name but but yeah, yeah otherwise though i mean they're the two if anybody knows any Korean directors, it's probably going to be the, one of those two, if not both of them. Right. They're the ones who... I def- wonder, What's that? Well, I was just going to say, I wonder if um, there was... If there's something about what they do and their style that's it's really kind of having the impact. 
Uh, I mean, granted, I would I would hope it's not just two directors that have found that and and others can uh, benefit from it as well. But uh, I wonder if their style is just it really has some well, element I think to the, it. I think they're it. So going back to the whole K-pop thing. And, and maybe in also the parallel in, in Japanese culture. I mean, Japanese culture is huge, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In the United States, in the West. And we all know about anime. We all play, you know, f familiar with video games and um, um, maybe the monster movies, et cetera. But like Japanese cinema outside of those, those well-known uh, genres or styles or whatever isn't a, isn't as a kind of a well-known quantity in the United States as Korean cinema is is becoming and I think mm -hmm. there's probably also an ambition on the Korean in the Korean government and the Korean um, movie industry and entertainment industry the music industry obviously to be a force in the world in a, a kind of an ambition to be a player um, yeah. and that I think that has is also a part of it you know there has to be an ambition within the country to want to be, you know, a massive, uh, not necessarily a success, but, you know, an influence and have a lot of, so, you know, I think um, they have ramped up their, their production. That's why you see all these TV shows that are available on Netflix. And um, as far as the movies and, and Bong Joon-ho and Park Chan uh, in particular, I think also it has to do with their own individual ambition to bridge the gap and to, um, to work with Western pr production companies. Like if you look at Snowpiercer, uh, mm -hmm. that movie was like, it's Korean, but it's also European in terms of its production, in terms of its financing, in terms of how that movie got made. You have um, a lot of Korean, well-known Korean actors, but you also have well-known Western actors. So that was a collaboration and that was like a, I don't know exactly how that movie came about, but Bong Joon-ho obviously had some desire to to make a, a western movie for old boy i don't know what park john like kind of ambition was in order to westernize but we uh, one of the movies i talked about a couple months ago when we uh, spoke before was um a movie that he did in english i can't think of what it's called hold on anyway so he's he had already made a western movie or a movie in english with western actors and then you know bong joon ho mm -hmm. went on to make okja and that was financed by netflix so, again, I just think it has to do with the Korean industry wants to be a, a player, essentially. And then you also have individual directors mm -hmm. who want to be more international directors as opposed to just, quote unquote, Korean directors. Right. And I, I would really hope that it could continue down this road and it, I hope it flourishes because nothing about the films, and even even if it was a little bit more steeped in their culture, Stoker. I feel like Sorry, they do a great movie. Stoker, there you go. Um, even though they kind of have it uh, steeped in their culture, it it never feels like we don't understand what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it could be so steeped into another country's culture and their way of life that it it can feel a little hard to relate. But I don't feel like that's ever been the case when I watch these films. In fact, it fascinates me if there's something I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, or, or how something works that I want to know more. Yeah, you're looking at a country like countries like Korea and, and Japan that industrialized so rapidly in the in the second half of the 20th century and have gone on to become these massive technological and industrial powerhouses. That even though they have historically um, vastly different cultures than uh, Western countries, they're still Westernized, to use kind of the colonial <laughs> uh, language for it, in a way that we, we still recognize. I mean, it's not so different anymore. Obviously, the language is really different, mm -hmm. and there's still a ton of like cultural practices that we um, may not understand, but there's enough there where it's like, you, you still understand what's, I mean, it's and it, it's, I think it's just different enough for a lot of people to be intriguing. There's always something about foreign cultures that are intriguing to certain types. Of, I mean, that's why everybody travels, right? Right. So there's that kind of like touristy in, interest in, in, in watching movies from uh, different, different cultures. And so even if, I don't know, it's hard to watch, uh, it's hard to watch Squid Game. There's only really one episode 
that takes place like in in the country. Everything else happens out in on the island of Squid Game. And that's right. recognizable enough to enough to people who are familiar with uh, any other dystopian Hunger Games type, you know, genre movie or story that that's recognizable. But the only, you know, the one episode or I guess the beginning of the first episode, too, that takes place in Seoul, like you recognize Seoul as a as a modern metropolis and mm -hmm. the things that are happening in there, you know, gambling and, um, you know, other daily life activities. It's, you know, it's relatable to anybody who isn't living out in the middle of nowhere, I guess, but... <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, I'm interested to see how far this goes. I'm sure, uh, as you kind of mentioned prior, Netflix is going to be pushing the hell out of these uh, shows and movies now, hoping to find their next big hit. Uh, Squid Game Season 2 is apparently going to happen, which... Even if it if it didn't, I I don't think I would have been disappointed. Oh no, I, I'm totally satisfied with that story arc. I think it was yeah, it was great. I'm never the kind of person who who usually wants more because it usually mm -hmm. it's never it's oftentimes not as good if it keeps going and going. So right. I'm happy to have gotten the experience that I got out of Squid Game, and I don't begrudge anybody mm -hmm. to, to especially the original of, creator if he wants to keep going then fine. Uh, it sounded like he wants to go back into making more movies as opposed to doing another Squid Game, but I guess he'll probably take the opportunities um, as they come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm like you. I don't feel like there there was anything about it. Even the way they ended it, I, I still would have been perfectly fine just being like, Okay, well, yeah, let our imagination a, take over from there. Exactly. Oh, yeah, as, absolutely. And I totally 100% agree. I, mm. You know, there's a, there are a few open-ended uh, questions that, that can be resolved with more stories, but I'm more than happy to, like you said, fill in the blanks. Hmm. For that particular show, I, mm. I feel like it would have been perfect. Uh, there are a few others that I could do without another season. So hopefully it won't be a disappointment when it does happen. Um and hopefully we'll see more great movies from maybe newer directors. No offense to the other two. I'm just saying hopefully everyone else gets their shot and we can see more yeah. great films from well, I think other up-and-coming Korean filmmakers. I'm sure we will. And, I mean, there's, there's, uh, so, uh, um, there's, there's so many out there that if you are more interested in, in, like, Korean cinema that doesn't necessarily have the ambition to be global cinema, um, mm -hmm. then that would be another, yeah, there's a lot for you as well to go look into and other directors and other a actors and um, that you could kind of go down that rabbit hole if you wish. But mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with kind of staying with um, kind of the big names and the and the crossover successes either because they're fantastic. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so happy that, you know, Bong Joon-ho won an Oscar. I mean, I'm sure he doesn't give a shit about the Oscars, but it's cool that he did and yeah. Um, it's cool that he's made uh, Snowpiercer and Okja, but it's also cool that when he did win an Oscar, it was a Korean film that he won the Oscar for, not like a crossover film. Yeah. And when Park jong uk made a, a movie financed by Amazon, he made The Handmaiden, which was, I mean, <laughs> like a sexy, like a sex kink, like, um, I don't know, just torture Film. I mean, he made a fucking Park John uk film, you know, like he didn't, yeah. he didn't uh, kind of tone it down for Jeff Bezos or, you know, any, anybody else. He made his own, he made another movie <laughs> along his, his line of movies. And uh, yeah, hopefully that won't change. <laughs> I mean, if you're not going to let the man do what he does, what are you paying him for? Well, yeah. That's I what mean, you signed up for. Exactly, but it's kind of drawn a parallel to maybe like Chloe Zhao, and if you're going to sign her to make a movie for Marvel, then just let her make a movie as opposed to make a Marvel movie. Yeah, and you know, not to get down too too into the weeds, it's just fantastic. It's a it's an interesting like the directors who have gone through Marvel who have have either made a movie or maybe backed out. Um, Edgar Wright comes to mind. He was an, sure, initially yeah. signed up to do Ant Man and the Wasp, and then he said no because he didn't want to make a bland Marvel movie. Anyway, 
got off topic. But if you're no, 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 um, I mean, uh, if you're looking for recommendations, I I don't I haven't uh, watched a ton of stuff a, a ton of stuff on um, Netflix Korean shows, but I just did start watching one last night because I wanted to at least have something to talk about for this episode. Um, if you're not sick of zombies, um, maybe check out The Kingdom. Have you heard of that? I have not. It's really cool because it's like an historical drama. Um, so it takes place in, I don't know what time period of Korean past, but it's, you know, c costume drama, um, court intrigue, you know, emperors and and princes and, and queen uh, princesses and the, the dynamics, the dynastic squabbles, I guess you could say. And it's also a zombie story. And it's really gory. Oh. It's really violent, uh, really gross, but also it's kind of a, a mashup. It's kind of a, a pleasing mashup okay. of <laughs> of things that I would recommend. I haven't, I just started watching it. So I think there's two seasons on Netflix now. I don't know if it's going to hold up, but I, I bet it would. So if you're, again, if you're not sick of zombies, but the way the zombie outbreak happens is, is, mm. is, is, uh, is fucking twisted. I'd recommend okay. it just just to see how they were like. Just for that. Oh, long. you want a zombie outbreak? How about how about this one? Um, so it's pretty okay. cool. You got me in now. Yeah. I'm so, I, not to not to simplify things too much, because cultures are never just one thing. But in in terms of the Korean culture, there's a very and this is coming from a white guy. So please feel free to just start rolling your eyes right now as I speak, and continue rolling your eyes. But to simplify it in to the to a ridiculous degree i think there's an underdog sensibility to korean culture it's historically been a very poor country uh not na not necessarily now but if you watch squid game there's definitely um kind of a an income inequality aspect to it that they're going through um much like the united states which is probably a, another reason why that resonates so much here and really across the western world as well but so there's a there's a hu they have a, a sense of humor. It's kind of that under underdog sense of humor, I think, and um, they have a very off the wall sensibility where they're not afraid to try things. And even if like even like a lot of the stuff on Netflix is kind of like po really polished and sanded down, kind of mainstream entertainment. Even those shows have that kind of just uh, just there's a just a weird, funny, quirky humor to it, and. Uh, they don't. They're never afraid to like in, inject humor in something that you would think wouldn't be a humorous situation. Um, so that, that's one reason I really, I'm really drawn to Korean um, entertainment. So if you're not familiar with it, then that might be kind of a, you know, something. Even like Old Boy, which is not funny. It's awful. You know, it's gory and violent and yeah. twisted and mean. But there's just this just this odd oddness to it and i think that's what mm. draw you know maybe draws people to some of the korean cinema and and tv and stuff so yeah the host is a is a film mm -hmm. that i remember having that same kind of experience with because there was something happening and i didn't know whether i needed to laugh mm -hmm. or be upset and it was, it made me uncomfortable and yeah, I, I definitely get what you're saying. There. Yeah, they have that put putting you in the. A lot of them are very uncomfortable movies to watch, and this is this is mm -hmm. really we're talking about Bong Joon Ho and Park Jong Un, not <clears throat> and not Korean cinema writ large. But those two directors right. in particular have the ability to really put you um, to make you uneasy, <laughs> which I think is a, a yeah. great place to be when you're watching a movie. Is like never sure about what it is that you're supposed to be feeling or yeah yeah i get you well um yeah if he, if everyone wants to check out some of this stuff i'm definitely going to check out the kingdom based on your recommendation now and uh, if if our audience has not watched any of these films highly recommend anything that we've mentioned um be prepared though some are um a little, little out there. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, disturbing, twisted, hard to watch, but uh, damn good. If you if also you want one, another Bong Joon-ho movie that's uh, Korean, you know, before he broke out into the West, that um, is really 
really weird, but funny and just a really great um, quirky, offbeat, just, I don't know, it's really hard to describe it, but watch Mother as well. Okay. It's on my list. Yep. And I think it, it's on, it's streaming somewhere. I think it's on Amazon. Okay. It's, 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 it's really great. Them. If you guys want to check out these films, definitely do that. Uh, you can let us know what you checked out, or if you have a Korean film you want to uh, suggest to us that maybe something we're missing, let us know. You can do that on Twitter. You know, hashtag Cinema Salsa. You can just say, hey, guys, did, did you watch uh, this Korean film? And we'll be like, uh, maybe. Maybe <laughs> we did. Maybe we didn't. I don't know. But anyway, hey, thank you for listening. You can uh, tell your friends, find us on all those major podcasting platforms like Anchor and Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Google Podcasts, and Podbean, and even YouTube.com slash Pencil Paper Productions. Or you can just go over to PencilPaperProductions.com slash Cinema Salsa and you can find everything right there. Just bookmark it and boom, you got it. You got it figured out. As always... Be sure to join us again next time. But until then, keep supporting your local theater. This has been a Pencil and Paper Podcast Network production.